Here is the last picture of a man who would lead 129 officers and crew on an Arctic expedition that would never be seen again. His name, Sir John Franklin. They were some of the top seamen at the time, and these are their faces. Images taken on the docks just before they departed. And so they set off from England into the Arctic, last seen by an Arctic whaler off the coasts of Greenland and never to be seen again. Three years later, and then more time passed and still no word from the Franklin expedition. And there was worry in the halls of the Admiralty under Sir John Barrow. Over the course of the next several years, over 30 expeditions were set out looking for the Franklin men. But this just resulted in more death and destruction. It would be more than 10 years later that a British explorer named Francis McClintock would come upon a grizzly scene. It was here that some dozen men perished together with their lifeboat, waiting in vain for help, and in the end, cannibalized each other to the last man. While on my expedition searching for the lost ships, I wanted to see this place. It was called Both Place. Hey guys, this is a little video of me flying along Simpson Strait. It was coming from uh, Joa Haven, and I was heading over to Erebus Bay. This was 2011, and about nah, nine months before this, I submitted my application to the NIRB, and then that was handed off, actually for the first time, to, uh, for some reason, to Clay, which was Doug Stenton and Julie Ross, so that was interesting. But oddly, all the communications up until this point indicated that there was a holdup the whole time because of what they called the stakeholders. Yeah, the stakeholders, what they were talking about were the Inuit, and really specifically the Inuit of Joa Haven. Hmm, that just kind of seemed odd. So this going on for several months, I just decided to take the initiative and uh, go up there, see for myself. And, totally surprised as they were, they never received anything. They never got any documents, any permit application, nothing. <laughs> I mean, we'd been working together for years, so, well, needless to say, it got approved right on the spot. I was flying the shoreline of Simpson Strait, south shore of King William Island, to the west. Just amazed how barren and lifeless this area is. I've been on the ground here a handful of times and I can't tell you one single time that I've ever seen a caribou in this particular region, not like down south in the Barren Lands or Churchill. I did see some muskox, but you, you, you have to think, you can just imagine what the Franklin men went through. They probably thought, well, we, I could just, we could shoot game as we, as we go and uh, you can go months here without seeing an animal. And then once in a while, the, uh, you know, at certain periods, the caribou herds, small herds do come through, but it's, it's more on the rarity. The other thing you observe when you look down here is the amount of water. And just imagine trying to hike or trek 
through this quagmire of water and silt and rock. Uh, it's, it's just, it goes on forever. And most of these lakes that you're looking at, they're only a few feet deep. I mean, you're not going to catch fish in these, most of these lakes. So here I finally reached the coastline at Erebus Bay and the tide is fairly low at this point. And it's really interesting, there's huge tidal flats. There's no definition of uh, shoreline, so to speak. So this was a pretty interesting find. There was a sledge, looked like the remains of a, something from long ago that was sitting out there. I circled several times to have a look. And as I got lower, it was clear to see it was some type of sledge dismembered. It looked ancient, so I was really excited. Here I am tracking from the south northbound, just having another look at it. And uh, both places just adjacent to this, just the next uh, little shoal over. But this was, uh, I wanted to get some good documentation on this. and. What's kind of interesting is this is, <laughs> this is where my trouble really started with Doug Stenton and Julie Ross when I posted this find, but more on that later. So let's spin the clock back to 2003. That was my first visit to Joa Haven. It was a beautiful sunny day and air was smooth. Visibility good, landed on the gravel runway, checked in at the terminal, and uh, first thing to do was get the airplane secured. Heavy winds were coming in. Those were my chocks for my wheels. And got the drill out, drilled my own tie-down stakes into the permafrost, and then just settled in. So I have to say, I, I was immediately welcomed by the people of Joe Haven, starting right off at the uh, airport terminal. I can say this, they were definitely a happy people. So after getting acquainted with some of the folks there, the plan was to work my way over to meet with the mayor and the leaders and of course the elders to talk about what my mission was and how uh, we were going to work together. So I was about to start hiking down the hill when I saw this airplane arrive. Thought I'd wait around to see who it was and an older gentleman got out of the plane, who was sole occupant, and he seemed to know a lot about this Franklin stuff. So we spent a lot of time chatting and he gave me all kinds of great input and I was really impressed. But what I didn't know was this was a famous guy. I found out later his name was Willie Lasserich. Sadly, he's passed on now. But you can find him in the Canada Bush Pilot Hall of Fame. So I finally made my way down to the Hamlet offices. And when I got there, I met with the mayor and a few folks there. And we had a prearranged meeting with the elders and we had that meeting and lots of words were exchanged and gifts were exchanged and a lot of big plans were made. One of the things they told me there was money set aside, a lot of money for a road system and a park for Franklin commemorating the, the expedition, but they didn't know where to put it. And we uh, kind of teamed up and thought, you know, if, we, if I find something big, then uh, we could strategize uh, on that location where something might be found. As we closed the meeting, they said the person I should work with was a guy named Louis Kumakuk. It was starting to get late, and my last stop for the day was going to be the canteen. And as I headed there, I looked behind me and I started noticing all these kids following me. I probably was quite a curiosity to look at. Anyway, when I got to the canteen, there were more kids there, and they all gathered around. So I started telling them adventure stories and then we started playing some games and just having a general all around good time and I bought them all slushies, blue slushies, so we all had blue blue tongues. Well, 
almost all of us. So the next morning I was led over to Louis's house and uh, met his family. They welcomed me inside, a wonderful family. And man, we had, uh, I was amazed we had uh, beluga whale and, and raw caribou uh, on paper, wax paper I think it was, right on the floor in the kitchen, I'll never forget that. And uh, it, was, it was a wonderful experience. But more weather was due to come in soon, so it was time to go. There was no gas in Joe Haven, so I had brought five jerry cans of my own and having that preloaded, checking weather. I was on my way, had a few uh, more stops to go and finish my work that year, but it was a great first year to get my feet wet and uh, get the lay of the land, meet the people, and I was really looking forward to coming back. Well, not long after, I uh, hadn't heard from Louie for a while, and then, then I saw this in the news. He was working with the Canadian government and using the methods that I have outlined with them that we were going to do together. So uh, he definitely awakened a sleeping bear. So let's get back to Boat Place. I'm on the ground, and I'm wondering what really happened here. Walk the shores. Spent a lot of time there, just trying to imagine what the Franklin men faced. Looking out over the ocean, being the last people probably to see the ships as they left, hiking south, southeast, and knowing that the lifeboat was pointed back at the ships when it was found by McClintock. Why was it pointed that way? I mean, that's, that's a big clue in itself. I mean... They were obviously headed back to the ships, and what were they thinking? I mean, why did they stop there? I mean, this is where they all died. Well, what we know is the ships were first stranded way to the north by Victory Point, and sure enough, they drifted south in the ice pack over the next one to two to three years, and eventually these guys were hiking the shorelines, uh, abandoned ship, hiking south, southeast, and they probably came through this point and didn't want to hike to the uh, west, so they cut across King William Island to the south, southeast. I mean, that's what the trail shows. So after putting myself in their place, and I, I stood there a long time just circling around and staring out there trying to figure out like, like what, what it would have been like. What was, we're heading down, we're heading out. Uh, I'm going to take a last look at those ships. I'm going to remember seeing those ships as I go inland, never to see them again in my mind. So most or all of the men were down to the south, southeast towards Starvation Cove. There had to be a reason. What was the reason that they were heading back to the ships? Why would they do that? Well, what if there was a warm summer, maybe that next year or the year after? Certainly they'd be trying to get back to the ships thinking that the ice, the ice would have freed up. Maybe they could reman the ships. But why would they stop there? Why in that exact place? Well, I thought because that's the place, it's like a corner. You're coming up along the land, you're backtracking. And that's kind of the first area you start to get a real glimpse of the shoreline going north where the ships used to be, if indeed they were gone. And when they got there, they probably did remember the ships. They probably did see them before they left because the later explorers found, they found a multitude of supplies and equipment, including telescopes. They most certainly could have seen the ships way out there to the north when they left. I don't think the ships looked close to shore. I don't even think they may have been recognizable. But peering through the telescope, they probably looked like two dots, way, way out there, almost like a mirage. And in fact, it probably turned out to be when they came back because the ships were gone.
So back then with this theory in hand, after really thinking about it, trying to piece the things together, this was the basis of my theory that either one or both of the ships was remanned. Maybe a warm summer, maybe it was 1850, somewhere around there, and some of the men got back to the ships and resailed. And lo and behold, about five years later, the HMS Terror was tentatively discovered. Where? In Terror Bay. And there's no way it could get to Terror Bay unless it was remanned and sailed. It was probably a warm summer that year, and the men that hiked back ahead of all the others first made it back to the ships, probably sailed it south as far as they could. They could have sailed west to continue the journey, but it makes sense that they tried to sail to the east. They were probably trying to retreat back home. But there in Terror Bay, that was to be their final act. <laughs>